Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are gracious. You are kind. You are good. If you believe it, shout amen, somebody. Amen. amen. Come on, give somebody a high five. Say, you look good this morning. Look at your neighbor that was your second choice and tell him you don't look bad either. Much better than last week. Come on. Good morning, everybody. Let me take a moment, look into the camera, say good morning to all our online viewers this morning. Come on, let's give them a hand. Let's make them feel welcome this morning. We are so glad that you've decided to join us, and we pray that um, this is really my prayer this morning because of the topic that I'm going to address, that you will really experience God right where you are, and that you will feel Him minister to you, that, it will, that you won't feel the distance. Amen? Amen. The most beautiful church in the world. Come on. Say amen like you mean it. I know some of you go like, "Mm mm-hmm, somebody knows. (laughs) Amen. Listen, um, while we add it, look to that neighbor that was your first choice and tell them something good is about to happen to you today. Come on. Can you feel it? It's in the air. There's anticipation. God's really going to do something this morning. I'm excited. Um, The title of my message, (laughs) and listen, um, just get ready for the best six hours of your life. We're going to have church today. Um, I've got so much to go through, all our first-time visitors. Don't worry, that was just a joke. We won't keep you here six hours. It will be five and a half. Amen. So, a little half hour for... Lauren, are you still here? We are really praying, but just wait till after the six hours of the service, okay? And then you can go into labor, okay? So we're really anticipating that baby. And Joffrey says, amen, thank you. (laughs) Okay. Um, uh, The title of my message today is Stuck in the Middle. Stuck in the Middle. Um, But before I start, I need to do a disclaimer, and it's going to be a half an hour disclaimer. Um, Today's message is a message of correction. And instruction, so go with that in mind. Um, How many of you understand that correction is part of the responsibility of a pastor? So 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, say correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work, and that is you. Amen? God wants you to be complete and thoroughly equipped for good work. So, if we cannot be corrected as Christians, we shouldn't call ourselves Christians. Thank you. I'm going to have one amen here. The word disciple means to be under discipline. Did you know that? So, if you're a disciple and we're all disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, it means that you're under discipline. Now, if you want to test the character of somebody, correct them. Just correct them. You'll see if there's character or not. Amen? Because God, listen, God wants, He says, I correct those who I love, I I love, I correct. Amen? So, today, once again, I, I must address a topic that's come under tremendous attack within the church. And I'm also, in all love, not going to apologize for what I'm about to preach because I clearly heard the Holy Spirit command, and I, and I use that word deliberately, He commanded me to preach this message because if you know me and if you know my wife, we usually just shy away. I'm like, God, I'm not. I'm like, really? I don't want to do this. I want people to like me, Lord. I don't want to be the nasty one. You know, parents? Like, why must I always discipline the children? I can't be the bad one. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like you want people to like you. You want people to love you. You don't want to be the one that brings correction. But you see, there's a trap for many pastors these days. It's a trap. It's really, it's a trap. That we want, we want our services to be as smooth as possible. Everything must be, just don't upset you know, upset the apple cart. Just don't, just don't stir. Just keep it in the middle. Just keep it safe. 
Let the services run smoothly. Everything must be nice. It must almost be like a show. People must feel like, whoo, it must be, we, we happy. You didn't, you didn't, you know, you said some stuff, but you didn't really get into my stuff. You know what I'm saying? You didn't, you didn't really bother me. Well, if I look at the ministry of Jesus, it didn't go like that. There was nothing smooth about it. Can you imagine we have a service where we start chopping people's ears off? Hmm? Like, Pastor, why are you, why are you making that whip? <laughs> Just wait and see. <laughs> you know, you know, a, a service is not going smoothly if you start your sentence with your brood of vipers. <laughs> Jesus gets into the stuff that's bad. You see, it's like if you've got a loved one, with a tumor. You don't hate the loved one, you hate the tumor and what it causes in their lives. And in the same way, when God addresses us and He corrects us, He's removing stuff that's harmful to us. Amen? So that's the heart. That's, that's, that's the heart of, of the message this morning. And, and, and you know, that's the attitude with which we're going to address what we're going to address. You know, so please understand that I'm not going to tippy-toe around the tulips this morning. But what I'm saying, I'm saying in love. Amen. And because why? Because I'm angry, not at you, at the devil. I'm angry with what's happening in a church. God's people are being stolen from. They are being robbed from. You know, before... Today's message, let me say this and listen to me very carefully right now. Before today's message, you might have been a victim of the devil robbing of you. But of you, you know, if you're being deceived after today, you're not a victim anymore, you're a volunteer. Okay. Because you stand accountable for what you know. That was very nervous, Mpo. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> Pastor, you're on your own. <laughs> you know, no, but I'm, I'm saying this in love. If you are being deceived after today, you're not a victim anymore. You're a volunteer. And there's a huge difference. Amen. So, I feel an urgency in my spirit around this message. So, after that, very scary introduction. Are you ready? Amen. Are you ready for your life to be changed? Let's go to our favorite scripture in all of the Bible, Malachi 3. Thank you. Malachi 3, we're going to read from verse 6. Something like, I knew it. I just knew it. He was going to go there again. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, you're going to enjoy this one. Malachi 3 from verse 6. For I am the Lord, and sometimes I change my mind. <laughs> For I am the Lord and I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? And then we all know this one, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Say tithes. Say offerings. Did you notice that the earth didn't open up and swallow you? You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation. Now it just brings like, God, why do you need to bring the neighbors into this? Right? You are cursed. <laughs> like, I thought you were talking. No, 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 no. It's something that happens to a whole community. Do you get this? Amen. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of this. Like, you, you, you need to read this with, like, like, Jesus was coming from Mitchell's plane. Now try me in this. Try, try me in this. Come on, tr try me. You want to try me? <laughs> try me in this. This is actually the attitude with it. Like, try me now in this. Right? Says the Lord of hosts. 
If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. How many of you can do with some blessing that there's not room enough to receive it? And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. You don't have to do it. He'll do it. So that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail, fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land. May South Africa be a delightful land. Now he says in verse 13, your words have, have been harsh against me. Did you notice that our words can be harsh against God? Yet, says the Lord, yet you say, what have we spoken against you? Who, me, Lord, never. I love you. I'm your most beautiful child. The pastor just said it. Hmm? You have said, it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance? Woo, that's serious, isn't it? <clears throat> Excuse me, Friday, Fridays, how many of you like Fridays? Come on. Fridays are had a nice sabbatical day, and we try, I say try, and take off. You know, we love spending at least the mornings together after we drop the kids off at school. And this past Friday, we went to a museum. I love museums. How many of you like museums? Amen? Okay, that's four of you. Like, Pastor, you're really a nerd, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, it gives us a glimpse in times gone by, doesn't it? Like you walk, uh, I haven't been there for many years, but if you go to Gold Reef City and you go into some of those old houses, in a, do they still have that? I don't know. Um, you know, but it's just like you step into the past and you see and you thank God, you become thankful because we have electricity, everybody. We have running water. Come on. Amen. If you ever feel ungrateful about your life, just go there. Amen. So, so that you can see, we've got running water. We've got electricity. We've got toilets with doors on them that's in the house. And that's a biggie. But in any case, so... It gives us a glimpse, that was much funnier than what you laughed at it, but in any case, it gives us a glimpse in times gone by. Unfortunately, there are no museums for the early church of the book of Acts and in the epistles. We only have scripture and some historical context to help us understand what it was like. But I've often wondered if we could go back in time, imagine this for a moment. Let's time travel, this is like a movie. You step into your time travel machine, you go back in time, and we go to one of the churches, you know, in, um, in, in Ephesus or Colossa or uh, Laodicea, and we, and we go to one of those, chur those churches and we spend a month there. Just imagine, how much will their church culture differ, differ from ours? It's a good question, isn't it? Right? If they had to spend time with us, and they would come here for a month, and they would visit our church services, and they would visit our church and spend time with all of you, would they be shocked? Would they be encouraged? Would they walk away confused? Would they, would they be inspired by our dedication to the kingdom of God? I imagine if they listen to our sermons, what, what would they think? How much would it differ from the apostles of that time? Come on, these are good questions, isn't it? Hmm? Would our sermons inspire them, confuse them? Would, would the message from our pulpits, would they find it flimsy? Or would they find it filled with Holy Ghost power? I've often wondered... If, if they come into our culture and they spend a month in your home, in my home, and after they've recovered from the shock of TVs <laughs> and the internet, and they listen to us and they see what, what, what we spend our time on, how dedicated are we to the Word of God? 
Would it even compare? Now, I don't have the answer. I don't know. Hopefully, they'll find that we've built upon the revelation of the apostles. But does it really change our lives? We get a, a glimpse of a scenario like this in the book of Revelation. Revelation 3. Let's quickly go there. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write. Now, that word angel is an unfortunate translation. It literally means actually the overseer, the pastor of that church. It wasn't an angel over the church. It was actually the pastor. It's addressing the pastor. If you want to go into ministry, um, pray. Okay? <laughs> These things say the amen, the faithful, and the true witness. The beginning of the creation of God. Now he says to this church, it's like he's addressing our church. He says, listen, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. <laughs> we answer, once had a couple in our church who wrote an email to us, and they resigned from the church, and they said to us, um, you know what? We, the, the, the sermons doesn't make us happy anymore. Seriously. And I, I wonder if, <laughs> you know, <laughs> how the church in Laodicea felt after Jesus spoke to them like this. Are you happy? <laughs> Come on. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Jesus is addressing the serious spiritual condition in this church. Jesus is not hating on the church. It's like I said, he's hating on the spiritual tumor they were carrying, a sickness they were carrying. And he says to them, listen, you are not hot, neither are you cold. You are sort of stuck in the middle. Hence the title of the message. You are stuck in the middle, and because you are stuck in the middle, listen, I cannot use you to expand my kingdom. So in God's kingdom, there's no middle ground. You cannot have dual citizenship with the world and with the kingdom of God. Come on. Did you notice that the context of this passage was the kingdom of God? Family, I want to say this to you. That at the moment, the church is under tremendous attack. There's hostile forces. And it's not on the surface. It's not like the, the, the atrocity that's happening in the Ukraine at the moment. It is not missiles coming over and, and this big public display. This is very, very under the radar. It is like we are being infiltrated from the inside. It's not these massive explosions. It is like we, it's like there's sleeper agents within the church and it's busy killing the church. What are you talking about, Pastor Norman? I'm saying to you that a lot of churches, and I don't want to generalize here, but a lot of churches are serving God and mammon at the moment. And Jesus clearly said, you cannot do both. So I, I want to bring certain truths from Malachi 3 under the spotlight this morning. And the first thing is, God does not change. He says, for I am the Lord, I do not change. God is not the author of confusion. I find it interesting that the chapter that communicates the most clearly about tithing and offerings start out with this declaration about God's character. For I'm the Lord. It's like God knew what was going to happen in 2022. I'm, the, I'm God. I do not change. I cannot change. We've many times established from Scripture that tithing was established before the law. And has passed through the cross of Calvary into the New Testament. So we've not built a doctrine or a dogma around one verse. You do understand that. And, and if, if, you do, if you're not familiar with the message, I'm sure we've got it available on any of our platforms. And you can go and listen to that. That, that is why I believe what the Holy Spirit clearly spoke 
to my heart as a shepherd of the church today. And here's, here, here's the me- message that I want to echo in your spirit. Listen to me, all those watching online, look into my beautiful face. God, listen, will never tell any believer to stop timing. He will not. He will not. If you believe that God has taught you to stop tithing or not give your full tithe, listen to what I'm saying, not give your full tithe, you are being deceived by the enemy. And I'm going to establish this from Scripture for you. You are being lied to. From my observation, in the last 20 years, this crept in a tendency into the church that tithing is optional. It's optional. That, that God has somehow become blasé about generosity. That somehow God has changed his mind about this command in Scripture. Like, uh, you know what, it is, now it's 2022, they've been through enough. Hey, COVID. Oh, they've been through enough. No, no, no. You know what? Let me change my word. God did not do that. He did not do that, family. And, and let me make it clear, it's not always been the case. If you look from, the, there was this tremendous revival, even within our country, from the late 1970s, 1980s and 1990s, some of the biggest and the best churches in this country has been built. They, if, if, you, if you listen to the worship of that era, it still carries a tremendous anointing. But in the last 20 years, I've seen this truth come under attack. Like God has changed his mind. Right? And I believe that this deception is a plan from the pit of hell, and that's why I believe that God has called me to speak against this attack. Listen to 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 to 5. We, we, we shouldn't even be surprised. But he says, but notice that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Listen to this. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, does it sound familiar, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers over the internet and YouTube, that, no, okay, never mind, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. Now, now this is the scariest verse for me in the New Testament. Having, <laughs> having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people turn away. Did you, did you guys get this? But both I thought this was a grace church. It is. The apostle of grace wrote this. And I toned it down. I read from the New King James. If you wanted to suffer, I would have read it from the Old King James. (laughs) Hmm? So one of the marks of the end times is the grace apostasy. That means falling away. Family, I'm saying this with as much love as possible. If we are lovers of ourselves... Lovers of money, without self-control. Doesn't it stand to reason that the first thing we are going to compromise is on tithing and offerings? Because then stealing from God isn't so difficult, is it? It's getting very quiet in our ex-casino church. (laughs) Why is the devil deceiving so many in the church? This brings me to my second point. There's only 44 of them, so don't worry. No, I'm just teasing. There's only three. The church is starving. The church is starving. 
He says, bring all the tithes into, into the storehouse. Why? That there may be food in my house. God is very clear about his system of operation here. Now, in the Old Testament, there was a room within the temple where all the tithes were to be stored. Because remember, there wasn't currency like we've got currency today. So they brought all their tithes. If you had a hundred sheep this harvest, you're going to bring ten lambs. You get what I'm saying? You, uh, if you trade it in food or whatever, that's what you would have brought. And, and all that was brought. And within the temple, within the tabernacle, there was a room. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I'm talking out of correction. I think it was on the upper level. You, there was a storeroom. And all the tithes were there. Some interesting stories in Scripture, but I'm not going to stand it. So, you brought it to where? The temple. And there was a storehouse within the temple. Family, listen to me. And if you decide to leave the church after today, I still love you. Really, I do. But I need to say this. That the tithe doesn't belong to mission organizations or a TV ministry or an animal rescue organization. It belongs to your local church. It belongs to your local church. Jesus is not coming back for a parachurch organization. Jesus said, I will build my church. His priorities were clear. He sent out his disciples to build the church. He said, I cannot leave and send you the Holy Spirit because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to the church. Where is his priority? The local church. And if church is not important to you, the tithe and offerings will not be important to you. If church is optional to you, Tithing and offering is going to be optional to you. I told you it was a word of correction. But we're going to get to the good part right, right now. After the spanking, you will get your sweetie, okay? Now, just, <laughs> you're making fun of me. Yeah, a little bit. Okay, so his priorities were clear. Amen. So, so, many of us grew up used to the fact that there's food in our house. But for some of us, we know the terrible feeling of empty cupboards and there's mouths to be fed. Right? Have you ever really given thought to the implication of what God is saying? That there may be food in my house. What would it what would God's house look like if there weren't any food in his house? And what food is God talking about in context of the New Testament church? Now, here's a Bible interpretation, a hermeneutics principle. Scripture must explain Scripture. So what did Jesus call food? Let's go to John 4, verse 34. Jesus said to them, my food, say my food, is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. Do you not say they, excuse me, there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, unveil church, look at the fields. They are already white with the harvest. He said in John 6, verse 55 to 56, for my flesh is food. Oh, did he upset the religious community when he said this? And my blood is drink indeed. For who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Now Jesus didn't mean this literally. Otherwise all the, all the apostles would have chewed on Jesus. You know, because... You left me hanging there. I'm telling you, I will go on for four hours. Amen. So, but it, what was he talking about? He was saying, he was talking about the Holy Communion. Amen? My flesh and my blood. The communion which we're going to celebrate just now. 
So I believe fruit in this context represents several things. Number one, the Word of God, because the Word of God is the bread of life. Number two, making disciples and gathering the end time harvest. Number three, celebrating the finished work of Jesus and keeping Him center. Family, if Satan can keep food away from God's house by deceiving believers to not tithe, the church will starve because we will not win the lost. The gospel will not be spread all over the world. Are you getting this? And Jesus will not be celebrated and made known in our communities. Have you ever been to a community where there's no thriving church? It is dead. It is riddled with all forms of ungodliness. Crime is high. Marriages are falling apart. Murder is rampant. There is a darkness in that place. There is a spiritual uh, um, decay in that place. Because Jesus is not being made known in that place. I mean, if you get what I'm saying. Amen. Amen. And family, this is what's happening when there's no food in the house. The word cannot be spread. Jesus cannot be brought into a community. God is not in the business of closing down churches. He is in the business of building churches. Amen. So when you... you, you and, and here's the thing. You give your tithes where you are being spiritually fed where you get spiritual food. Remember, God is not the author of confusion. And listen to me. Look into my almond brown eyes. Family, just, just like you cannot have two spouses, you cannot have two churches. Ladies, you missed a great opportunity. <laughs> right? Why? Because you are planted, Psalm 92 says, in the house of God. Say planted. Have you ever seen a tree in nature planted in two places at once? No, you haven't. There's no such thing. Amen? When Jesus addressed the churches in the book of Revelation that we just read, He was clear and specific about His church. He didn't he didn't write to the angel of the church in Sardis. I write these things, except for Esti who sits there in the background, you know, in the back row, because every second Sunday she goes to the church of Philippi. You don't read that. Amen? Why? Why can't you belong to two churches? Because, Pastor, I thought it, we are the universal church. We're the big church. That's clever. That's cute. But there's such a thing as a local church. You can't belong to two churches because you're a worshiper and a minister of the gospel. You're not a consumer. Did you get that? You're not a consumer. Stop treating your church like a grocery store or a club. There might be one church that you are planted in. Yes, if you travel around, it's fine. Visit. But you are planted in one house. Amen? Your spiritual gifts were made for where you are planted. Amen? That there may be food in my house. That there may be food in my house. I want to get personal for a moment. Have you ever seen a starving person? Have you ever spent time, and I'm talking about somebody that's really starving. It's a horrible, horrible death. One day, Gerda and I were praying for our church several years ago. And as we were praying, God gave me a vision. And I saw um, a massive coiling snake in this vision that God gave me. And the snake was a constrictor, you understand? So it wasn't a venomous snake, it was a constricting like a python. 
And what happens is that this python was coiled around the church and it was, and it was literally suffocating the church so that there's no oxygen. When we allow Satan to deceive us, and when we rob God of the tithes and offerings, we are smothering the oxygen out of God's house. Why? Because you need oxygen to breathe. You need food. You, you need nutrients. What does oxygen do? It carries the nutrients through your blood to the rest of your body. It means that the local church will suffocate to death. Now, many of you know that my father passed away last month from COPD. It's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It's a lung disease caused by smoking, excessive smoking. If you are struggling to leave cigarettes, my pastor, are you telling me I'm going to hell if I smoke? No, but you're going to smell like hell. You <laughs> and you're going to get there quicker. I'm, 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 just, now this is just me talking. This is not the Holy Spirit. I just want to, I want to speak to everyone who struggles with this. Come out for prayer. You don't want to do that to your loved ones. Because you're not going to feel it now. But once you grow older, it will catch up with you. It's horrible. It's horrible. Now my dad wouldn't mind because of the relationship we had. He wouldn't mind me using this example. In fact, I think he would have encouraged me. So here's a picture of my father around 2017, 2018. Like they say in Afrikaans, spek fit in gesond. Here's a picture of my father taken in January 2021. You can see there's a massive difference. And between that picture... And 12 months later, after, just before his death, he lost another 10 plus kilograms. Now the picture doesn't do it justice, but some of you saw him here. He, man, he was thin, thin, thin. It was horrible. I literally saw my own father just disappear in front of my eyes. And he was, he, uh, he was a big guy. So, you know, if God, it, it, let me just tell you this, and, and um, when, when I had to go and claim his body from the morgue, um, so he was in the state hospital, and they wouldn't release the body without it being identified. And I wanted to see, now, I wanted to see for myself. So I saw him less than a week before that in hospital, and the last the last month was honestly the most horrible time of my life because he stayed with us. He lived with us. We were his caretakers. <laughs> and now I've seen many dead bodies. I've done funerals with open caskets and I had to look at the dead person while I'm preaching. You know, that's not nice. That's why we've got other pastors doing funerals. Okay, <laughs> it's a, and I've seen, because of where I've grown up, I've seen many dead bodies. And, and I was sort of dreading, because that's the last image, if you've been through it, you know what I'm saying? That's sort of the last image that gets stuck in your frontal lobe. You can't sort of forget it. And I had to identify my dad's body. And when I saw him on the gunny, I was like, it looked like he was asleep. His condition deteriorated so much in the last month that it didn't look like he was dead because it looked like he was dead before he even died. That's what happens to a starving person, to a person that's deprived of oxygen. Literally, everything in your body, in all your internal organs, and the doctors will confirm this, they start, you get heart disease, they pack up, it, it is, you, you die of, 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 of failure, of heart failure. If God 
can open up our eyes to see in the spiritual realm just for 50 seconds. I believe at the moment that the church globally look, will look like a starving person. I believe that we will look starved and diseased, the body of Christ, because there's no food in God's house. The churches are struggling. That is why God will never tell you to stop tithing. Because he will not deprive his bride from food. Amen? My last point. Robbery or blessing? Robbery or blessing? It says, verse 8, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. He says, you are cursed with a curse. He didn't say that God is cursing you. Did you get that? You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, the word rob here is very interesting. It is the Hebrew word kwaba, and it translates to take something away by force or without consent of the owner. We know all about robberies in South Africa, don't we? This is the Wild West, people. And if you've ever been, uh, I said to the kids the other day, when we were growing up, I remember the first time they burgled our house. And you, and you come home, and all your stuff is lying on the floor. It's so intrusive. Uh, things are being ripped out of, the, uh, out of you know, uh, out of their sockets, and things were lying on the floor, and somebody's been in your closet they got your secret stash of chocolates that was dear to... Oh, sorry, wrong meeting. Um, you, know, <laughs> you know, it's just so intrusive, isn't it? God says, you have robbed me. You've taken something by force from me. Now, Pastor Kuba Skippers um, shared this with our finance team several weeks ago. And, and he's done some further study, and he said the Hebrew pain also paints... Um, another picture of this word. So, if I've got a glass and I want to pour water for you in the glass from a container, that word rob also paints the picture of somebody putting their hands over the glass and keeping me from pouring water into the glass. So that means that when we stop tithing and giving offerings to God, we rob God from an opportunity to pour water out for us, to bless us. So not only are we robbing God of what belongs to Him, we are robbing Him of the opportunity to bless us. Come on. Amen. Amen. Well, I hear what you're saying, Pastor Norman, but you must understand that I've, I've got obligations and I've got bills to pay. You know, I, I, I just don't have enough left over to pay a full tithe. Once, you know, once I'm back on track, then I will tithe again. Heard that many times. My friend, I hear you. I feel you. I'm in the same boat as you. But I must tell you, it's not what the Bible teaches us. Mm -hmm, there he goes. He's telling single moms and widows to spend all their money on the church. No. I'm telling single moms and widows and everybody in this room and anybody who will listen to trust God. To trust God with their finances just as we have to trust God. Amen? Amen. You see, that argument falls in the same category as the couple who lives together before they get married, and they tell us we can't afford to get married right now. No, that's, that's, that's sad. You're walking in deception. It's not about the big wedding day. It's about being married afterwards, the rest of your lives. And young people, don't fall for that lie. That's a cop-out. It's keeping a back door open. It's not bringing marriage. It's not bringing your relationship under the covenant of God. So Romans 1.17, 1 
It says, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written. Say it with me. The just shall live by faith. The just shall what? Live by faith. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Amen. Just like we have to trust God, listen to me, that He's forgiven, I'm almost done, that He has forgiven our sins and washed us clean while we were still in sin, we have to trust God that He will take care of our every need. <laughs> you get us? Otherwise, we are saying like, listen, God, you know what? I can trust you with my eternal salvation. But you know, when it comes to day-to-day -day living, I just don't think you know how. When it comes to my finances, um, I'm okay. <laughs> Why are you so quiet? So we, we like... We, okay, if I die, I'm going to heaven and I trust God for that. But, but, but right now, no, you know, finances, I'm okay. I, I'll do it myself. How's it working out for you? Hmm? You know, especially South Africans. You ask them, are you Christian? Yes, I'm Christian. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm a Christian. Do you think we should allow God to be in the schools again? Yo, yeah, man, yes, yes. Let's do it. God must be in the schools. Do you think we should tell sports people to stop playing sports on a Sunday so that our sportsmen and women can come back to church? Yes, man, hallelujah, praise God, man. I'm a Christian, bro. I'm a man of God. Do you tithe? No, but you said you're a Christian. We are Christian when it comes to many things in this life. But the moment we start talking about money, people turn into atheists. Now, I've got this under control, man. I saw on YouTube. Man, I must slap you back into YouTube, man. Just get out of YouTube. Where, where's that person that you are listening to? When you're sick, will they come and pray for you? Will they come and visit you in the hospital? When your children want to get married, will they officiate the wedding? Hmm? When you die, will they bury you? No, they won't. No, they won't. That's why you need to be planted in a local church. Amen. If we reason like that, family, you will remain, listen to me, you will re remain broke your whole life. Because the tithe is called the first fruit. The what? Not the second fruit, not the third fruit. Not the fruit that you give after all the debit orders went down. It's called the first fruit. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field. Family, we've tried to get rid of the devourer in our own lives without success. Let's be honest. Amen. And I need to apologize. Now, I haven't spoken to my team about this. So, firstly, I apologize to the team that I haven't gotten around to speak to you about this. We've got a meeting tomorrow. I will address it. But I need to apologize from this pulpit that... We have spoken and we've said, it's okay as long as you give. As long as you give. You don't have to tithe. To give what you can. It's wrong. And I apologize to you now. It's wrong. God has convicted me. And I mean it 
seriously. He's convicted me. There's some stuff that has happened and I can't. Unfortunately, it's, it's not the time to deal it from the pulpit. Where I've seen, where I've seen how there's been stolen from our church. And I'm not just talking about now. I'm talking about going 20 plus years that I've served God. I've, I've observed certain things. And something happened last week. And I, I, and, um, it, it came, certain things came under my attention. And immediately the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And I'm like, God, what's going on? He says, you've not preached my full counsel. I checked with one of our apostolic elders, and he's like, you do not, you do not tell your church that, that it's okay to give whatever you can. We preach the tithe, because Jesus, Hebrew says, is the recipient of the tithe. Otherwise, I am part in you being robbed from a blessing. And I'm guilty of allowing you to rob God. So do with that whatever you want. It's still your relationship with God. But I need to say, and I'm not saying this to put you under a burden. Like somebody said to me once, you've put us under a tremendous burden. I've put no burden on you. I'm preaching the word of God to you. I'm preaching the word of God to you. It's not me who said it. God said it. You see, because he says he will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Now I've seen how, to, to quote the prophet, the canker worm and the locust has come to devour from God's people. It's devoured your marriage. Listen, if you've got marriage problem, problems, I can almost guarantee you that you've stopped tithing somewhere. I, I, I've seen over the years how the tithe is connected to a blessed marriage. And at the moment, a couple decide, like, okay, now we're going to compromise on this. The devourer comes into their marriage. You don't have to say amen, but it's still true. It has devoured your promotions. It's devoured your increase. It's devoured opportunities. But when we tithe, it's really quiet. When we tithe, family, he says, I rebuke the devourer for your sake. So God says, I will fight on your behalf. God could have said, listen, I don't want 10%. You see, it's an act of trust. Like we're going to take the communion with the communion elements. It's an act of remembrance. He could have asked for 90%. Can you imagine the gymnastics you had to do in your budget then? Hmm? Because all belongs to Him. So trust God in this today. The tithe opens the windows of heaven. The tithe opens the gateway to heaven so that blessing can be poured out over your work, over your household, over your family. That is why God will never tell you to stop tithing. It's the first, he says, he who is faithful in least will be faithful in much. He says, if you've not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will, who will trust, entrust to you the true riches? Of the kingdom of God? Jesus said that. He says he was faithful in least. In unright. God calls it least. Money for us is this big issue. It's this big issue. Well, pastor, I just want to have enough. Can I just quickly preach here for a moment? Pastor, I just want to have enough. You know, if I win the lotto. <laughs> if I win the lotto, you know what? Ooh, then I will tithe. You can't even tithe now. I told the Bible school students on, on Tuesday evening, we had this in our one church where a lady won 15 million rand in a lotto. 
It was in a small town in a free state. That should explain everything. Everybody, everybody stopped me like, are you that pastor? I heard that lady one. Did she die? <laughs> I promise you. People would stop me in, uh, you know, in shops. But she didn't because she never tithed before and that money ruined her. I know people who have all the money and they're surplus. Like, you, like some of you are dreaming of that now. Yes. Hallelujah. They're surplus. I've got a year's worth, worth of equity in the bank. There's no stress. They've got, they've got all the, the, the disposable income you can dream of. Everything is fine. The houses are paid off. All that stuff is, is in place. But I've seen how the devourer comes in and steal it. They've got no peace. They've got no joy. That's why Jesus called it least. He says, those who are faithful in the least will also be faithful in much. It's least, family. Your relationship with God is so much better. And God is just saying to you, listen, trust me with that. That's why Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon will compete for your attention. <laughs> Amen? That's why Jesus preached more about money than any other topic except for the kingdom of God. So if you're offended because I'm talking about money, you would have been offended with Jesus' sermons as well. Let me just say that. And I can tell you now to your face, my dear, with all the love that I can muster, a spirit of mammon has is, is, is got its tentacles in your heart. Hmm? You want to be free from addiction? Be faithful in the least. You want to prosper in your workplace? Be faithful in the least. You want to see God promote you and, and give you business opportunities? Be faithful in the least. There's a reason why Jesus spoke so much about this. Yeah, there he goes again. All the church wants is my money. No, I just told you. We don't want your money. We want all of you. We're not cheap. <laughs> Ooh, some of you are so offended. You are so offended. Grow up, man. Grow up. Grow up. Guys, come here and tell me. Oh, you talk about money. There he goes again. Be a man. Trust God. Trust God. If, if all we wanted was your money, we wouldn't have been in a community for all the years we've been. If we've been scoundrels, we wouldn't have been in a community for all these years. Come on. All I want is my money. That's a religious spirit lying to you. Chase that thing out. Rebuke it in the name of Jesus. It's time that we man up again. Be children of God. If we say we're Christian, we're Christian. We don't compromise on anything. Then we Christian. Amen? Don't call yourself a Christian but think you can compromise on the things of God. Be a man. Be a woman of God. Amen? All they want is my money. All the businesses out there want, want is your money, man. They've driven for profit. They're driven by profit. They're driven by a bottom line. And it's fine they shoot because it's business. But in here, it's so much more than money. But I'm saying to you that the church of God, the body of Christ is starving. Because we've entertained religious lies. And we've entertained the enemy. Amen? You want to prosper? You want to see how God turns your life around? Try me now in this, the Bible says. But I'm tired. I'm tired of, 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 you know, pastors having to be fighting a spirit of intimidation when it comes to this topic. 
I'm tired of, of the church saying we are Christian, but we don't live it. We pick and choose what we want from the Bible, like it's a buffet. Well, I like this. I like prosperity. I just don't like the way to get it. You know, I like this. Pastor, where does it say we need to be married in the Bible? What? Really? Oh, God loves everybody. It's okay if you're in sexual sin. It's okay. It's cool. God still loves you. Yes, He still loves you. But it will destroy you. The wages of sin is death. And then we preach the grace of God to make you free from the wages of sin. Oh, there they go. They're a grace church. It's like the church has gone schizophrenic. Can I just be honest for a while? It's like we schizos, man. So we say to you, the only way to get free of sin is through the grace of our Lord Jesus because it will teach us to renounce ungodliness that God has forgiven your sins. Oh, it's the easy gospel they're preaching there. Okay, God wants you to type. Oh, now they fall into the Old Testament. <laughs> what? We just want to go, screw this, man. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> Why are we teaching people? But Jesus said it. He said, you, you Greeks, you love knowledge. But the Jews, you want signs and wonders. So I came with knowledge. And you called me, uh, what was it? Uh, you, you, um, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? But Jesus said, they called him something, a heretic. And then I came with signs and wonders and you said, look, he's driving out demons by Beelzebub. So it's a thing we've been sitting with in the church for so long. And that's why we bring correction. And I hope that you hear my heart, that it's in love this morning. That God wants to bless you. And he wants to take care of you. And don't fall for foolishness. So if you watch somebody on YouTube... Ask, where is that person submitted? And I'm not encouraging you just to listen to us. And there's great teachers out there. There's great teachers out there with great churches. And it's fine. And, and it's listen. And sometimes we will share stuff with our team as well. Go and listen to this pastor. Go and listen to that pastor. they got great revelation. It's the body of Christ building each other up. But, but watch out. Watch out who you listen to. Who's that pastor submitted to? If he's even a pastor. Now I see actors are getting and they've got Insta Church and I don't know what else. And they're doing sex scenes like you blush when you see it. But Sunday they want to preach for you over the internet. Like really? Really? So if I start this broadcast of, hi guys. Jesus loves you. <laughs> Run away. Amen. Just run away. Who are you submitted to? What church are you pastoring? Amen. Okay, I'm going to stop now. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, your word says that those, those whom you love, you correct. And I just thank you. For this word of correction this morning. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you love us enough to speak into our lives. And Lord Jesus, that we know that you want to bless us and that you want to prosper us. That, that you have got our best interest at heart. So I pray, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that we will just receive this word as seed in our hearts this morning. That we will receive this word with joy and with gladness. And that we will say to you this morning, Lord, we are the clay, you are the potter. 
Will you please shape us, mold us, so that we will become more like you? And Lord Jesus, for those who have, of us for, for whom this truth has really cut deep, and maybe it's offended us, maybe we're upset about it, maybe there was things that were said and, and it cut deep, I pray that your Holy Spirit will minister now and that your Holy Spirit will convict of truth. That it will not just be my words, but Lord Jesus, that your Holy Spirit will illuminate the truth from your word and make it clear that the revelation will drop from our heads to our hearts. In Jesus' name. We thank you for it, Lord Jesus. I thank you for it, that, that we will understand that we are a household of faith. And that every household has got bills to pay, it's got things to do, there's practicalities. And that we will get that revelation right now in Jesus' name. I thank you for it, Lord Jesus. Maybe you are here this morning and you say to me, Pastor, you know, you've spoken some things, you've spoken some things about eternal salvation, but I'm here and I, I cannot say that that my relationship with Jesus is what it should be. That I'm spiritually in a bad place. Maybe you're here and you don't know God. You don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now, I'm not asking you if your parents were Christian, if you grew up in a Christian home. I'm asking you if you have a relationship with Jesus for yourself. For yourself. Because you could have grown up in a Christian home. That does not make you a Christian. You can't be a Christian by proxy. You need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, inviting Him into your life for yourself. And maybe that's you this morning, and in your heart you know I'm talking to you right now. In your head there's a bit of a battle, but in your heart you know I'm talking to you, even for those of you watching online. Maybe you are here and, and, and you've backslidden and your spiritual life is a mess. You're not where you should be. And you're uncertain if you should blow out your last breath within the next 24 hours where you will open up your eyes, whether it's heaven or hell. Then I'm speaking to you at this moment. You say to me, Pastor, will you please include me in that prayer? I don't want to leave the same way I came. My spiritual life is, is a big star. I need to make right with God. This is your opportunity. You say, Pastor, what must I do to be saved? It's easy, my friend. You cannot save yourself. You say, Pastor, do I, do I need to change my behavior? Do I need to change my looks, my clothes? No, my friend, you can't change yourself. That's why you need Jesus. Let Him do the changing. You just invite Him into your life. You see, religion has said, jump through all these hoops. No, Jesus said, come to me, all you are heavy laden and burdened, for I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So if that's you this morning, will you pray this prayer? If you fall into any of those two categories, Will you pray this prayer out loud with us this morning? Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I'm a sinner. Therefore, I qualify for your grace. Right now, I invite you into my life. I receive the free gifts of grace and righteousness in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord that I can call you Father in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give God a hand all over this place. If you've prayed that prayer for the very first time, we want to say to you, welcome to the house of God. Welcome to the family of God. We've got a free gift for you. It's a little booklet. You can just pick up there in the back. There's a table. And just pick that up there. It's for free, please. And just read through it. It tells you about all the, um, the decision that you've made and all the implications and there's some scripture and some study in there which will really help you. Our invitation to you is not to do life alone. Please go and pick that up and in there there's a little contact card if you'll just fill that in and somebody will help you there. Don't be shy. Please don't leave without this. It's very important that we connect with you. So part of our worship this morning is that we are going to celebrate communion and receive communion and this morning we are so so honored to have pastor Kobus Durker just come and minister 
the communion for us. Come on, let's give him a hand. They just came back from Galagari. If he looks rested, you know why it is. If he looks handsome, you know why it is. Amen. Pastor Kubis, thank you so, so much. Thank you, Pastor Norman. Thank you for the opportunity. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm so glad that I came today. Thank you for the word today, Pastor Norman. You know, as, this, as Pastor Norman was saying, that it's this time of the service where we're going to receive communion. And as we prepare ourselves to receive communion, there's a few important things that I just need to highlight and to remind you of what communion all means. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 28, it says there, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. There's a couple of things that I just need to highlight there. I think the first thing this morning, let's just become still before the Lord and let's just examine ourselves. There's some things that Pastor Norman was ministering to us this morning about tithing. Let's examine ourselves. What does our heart say to us? If there's things in your life that you need to make right with, with God right now, then do it. And it doesn't mean that you have to do a long prayer or anything like it. It's just say, Lord, I come to you and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. The Bible says that if you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins. The second part, part that I want to remind you of, His body was broken for us in verse 24. And it reminds me of a psalm in Psalm 103 of some, some truths. It says, Bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that's within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and forget not His benefits. We heard this morning of of tithing, the benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities? Who heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from destruction? Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? And the third thing is that he's talking about, he says, this cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. And the wonderful thing about partaking of communion this morning is that the blood of Jesus had washed us clean from all our sins. It washed us clean from our past sins, our present sins, and also our future sins. And so therefore the Lord is saying to us, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And so this morning, I want us to take the communion elements. If I can open it up. And we take the bread. Let's all just stand. Let's all just stand.
you might be here this morning and there's lack in your life. There's sickness in your life. There's some things that, you, that are challenging you in your life. And the Lord says to us, my body was broken for you. So while you partake in the bread this morning, receive from the Lord. Let's partake. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This morning we remember that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for us, shed his blood, so that this morning we can come boldly into his throne room as we are, because he loves us and he accepts us. And we will never forget what the blood of Jesus has done to us. So let's partake. Lord Jesus, this morning we come to you as your children. We want to declare, Lord, that you are an awesome and a great God. We want to declare, Lord, that we love you. And we appreciate you, Lord, for what, everything that you've done in our lives. And Lord, this morning, I want to lift up all my brothers and sisters here today. I want to ask you, Lord, to touch their lives. Bless families, Father. Bless the businesses. Bless every person, Father. And Father, I pray that you will open doors for everyone, Father. I pray that whatever we put our hands to, Father, will prosper. We thank you, Lord, for every need that will be met, spirit, soul, and body. And Father, we thank you for that. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Wasn't that precious? Thank you. May be seated. Is it good? Amen. You coming back next week? Amen. <laughs> Listen, um, so as you know, I think we've said enough about giving and tithing and offerings uh, through the message. Um, so we want to give you an opportunity to give. We've got electronic means in which you can do it. And some of you need to take a step of obedience and say, Lord Jesus, I need, I need to do this. And there's our banking details. There is card machines in the back. If you've brought cash, um, uh, the ushers will wait for you at the door. You can just deposit it there. So we're not sending around buckets um, because of regulations and stuff. But there is ways and means. And do it prayerfully. Do it with, without reluctance amen do it as unto the lord isn't god great amen well this is the part of the service where we're just going to say goodbye to all our online viewers but before we go just sit like this i'm going to proclaim a blessing over all of us and then we will close the service the lord bless you and the lord keep you the lord makes his face to shine upon each and every one of you we thank you lord jesus that as we go into this week your favor surrounds us as a shield we thank you, Lord, that we can have a confident expectation of good because we are your beloved children. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you keep us and our loved ones safe from harm. You keep us safe from any accident, from any disease, from any virus, from any mutated virus. You keep us safe, Lord. Lord, you open up doors where we need to walk through closed doors that we need to stay out of in Jesus' name. And we look forward, Lord, to receive preferential treatment wherever we go because we are your beloved children. If you believe it, shout amen, somebody. Let's say goodbye to all our online viewers. The Lord bless you guys. See you next week. Thank you.